writes our story. And sometimes he writes in chapters we don't like. And if he hasn't done that for you, just wait. Your turn will come. But his faithfulness is key. Because he not just he doesn't just write the chapter, write the story. He holds it all together. God is in control. Praise God. Praise God. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. If you have a Bible on you or a Bible app, open up to Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> if you couldn't quote it before, you might be able to when we're done. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 9. This is the words of Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. He said, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but as deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power of and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. We've been talking about the Lord's Prayer. Nothing wrong with memorizing the Lord's Prayer. Just understand that it's not a magical incantation. What do you mean by that? I, I was pondering. I, I say that sometimes. And, and I, I was trying to think of how to explain it. Something is magic when we think the power is in the words. I say the words. It doesn't matter my relationship with God. It doesn't matter uh, my relationship with, it, with anything, really. I said the right words. And then there is a, there's actually there's an example of that in the Scripture. In Acts chapter 19, there were seven guys that came. They heard Paul casting out demons, and they showed up at a demon-possessed man, in front of a demon-possessed man, and they said, we adjure you to come out in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches. In other words, they thought the name of Jesus was magic. All we have to do is show up and say the name Jesus, and the demon's going to take off. But it's not magic. The demon responded, said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, who are you? And then he busted them up some. So just remember, it's not magic. You can memorize the Lord's Prayer. Just remember the Lord's Prayer. It's not about, it's about a relationship. Prayer is about a relationship. Prayer is about a conversation. If we have a we had a uh, what's what's your favorite sports hero? Yeah, yours. I don't know. Recent. I'm sorry. Roman Gabriel. Do you know a fact about Roman Gabriel? Best quarterback the Rams ever had. Okay, so if you were to meet Roman Gabriel and go, oh, you're Roman Gabriel. You're the best quarterback the Rams ever had. And he said, how nice, how nice to meet you. And your next statement is, you're Roman Gabriel. You're the best quarterback the Rams ever had. And he said, uh, can he say anything else? You're Roman Gabriel. You're the how long would that conversation last? Probably not very long. But sometimes we treat God like that. Have a conversation with him. We started out talking about our father. It's an invitation to intimacy. It's an invitation to have a conversation, to come in and, and speak to him at a level we, we, we sometimes we put God so far above that we can't talk to him and I promise you he's not grading your prayer Charlie I would have answered your prayer but unfortunately Daryl prayed better than you so I had to give you a C and we're just gonna have to let that one go yeah <laughs> because it's like talking to your dad how many, yeah, how many of you had a father who when you showed up, he said, I can't give you an allowance because you didn't marshal your arguments correctly and use the right words? Some of you may have had a father like that. Most of us didn't. Most of the time, our father let us just talk to him. You know, he wasn't grading us. Now, we talked about in heaven, our father in heaven, remembering that 
he is our father but he is our heavenly father understanding his his transcendence understanding how far above us he is we we talked about the ways the fact that his ways are above our ways his thoughts above our thoughts we talked about the fact that he knows the thoughts and intents of our heart that's probably the one that's the hardest for us to grasp we uh, yeah all right <laughs> let's move on <laughs> He knows the end from the beginning. We just sang about that, and all the power belongs to him. Now, last time I was up here, we talked about hallowed be your name and how that was an expression of praise. We're going to make your name holy. We're going to declare your name. We're going to proclaim your name. And talked about the fact that starting off with praise is always a good thing to do when you're praying. In fact, if you go, if you find people that have models of prayer, They often start with praise or thanksgiving. And Jesus did here too. And we talked about that word hallowed hallowed, or hallowed. I've heard some people pronounce it. That means holy, consecrated, sacred, revered. We talked about the names being important because it says hallowed be your name. And uh, for us, a lot of times they're just a designation, you know. I'm named Tim. I'm named Tim because my uncle was named Tim. It really doesn't mean anything. But that's not how it was in the scripture. In the scripture, a lot of times they got a name that actually matched their character and who they were. We talked about Jacob, whose name was supplanter or cheat or deceiver, and he lived down to that name. Cheated everybody. But we also talked about Daniel, whose name was God is my judge. And when they came in and they tried to change him and they tried to take his faith away from him, he refused to let go of that name Daniel. He refused to let go of the fact that God was his judge, not Nebuchadnezzar, not any Babylonian, not any slave master. God is my judge. Talked about the names that God has called himself, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner or refuge. Jehovah Shema, the Shamah, the Lord who is present. Jehovah Sidkenu, that one's just fun to say. The Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Ra, the Lord our shepherd. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of peace. And Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. And Jehovah Roy, the Lord who sees. There's more. These are just a few that we mentioned. And then my new favorite when I found it out. The Lord our salvation. Or as we would say in Greek, Jesus. Or they would say in Hebrew, Yeshua or Joshua. Did you know that's what the name of Jesus means? The Lord our salvation or the Lord has become our salvation. We talked about declaring his name and how it's often linked with praise. And then to remember, not only do we need to praise his name, declare it, Blare it everywhere, but we also represent his name. We are called by his name. Remember who you are. Called by the name of God. Tonight we're going to talk about your kingdom come. That's where we're going to start. That's the top of verse 10. Your kingdom come. You know, that's, you, some of that, t- you can take that as to be the literal second coming. When Jesus ascends, comes back, and reigns on earth. And the early Christians, they used to pray this. In fact, the second to last verse of the Bible, Revelations chapter 22 and verse 20. Revelations 22 and verse 20, it says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. That's the voice of Jesus. But then John adds his voice and he says, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. He was saying, it's awesome. I want you to come. I'm looking forward to the day that you come. We had, a, we had a guy I knew one time, he would come in, and every day that he would show up to teach, he would say, I expect the Lord back around noon today. And he wasn't being, he wasn't being tried. He was, he was excited. He was just honestly every day looking for the coming of the Lord. And if you read Revelations chapter 21 and 22, it's no wonder that John said, Lord, come quickly sometimes we focus so much on the 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 judgment and the things that are happening in revelations that we forget that if you if you skip the whole book of revelations because you're scared of judgment and plagues you miss out on the wonderful promises that are in revelations chapter 21 and 22 i'm just going to read a couple here revelations 21 and 4 
God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Even so, Lord, come quickly, looking forward to that day. How about Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3? And there shall be no more curse. I could pause there for a moment. The curse is over. The curse is done. It's gone. No more curse. See Genesis chapter 3, if you're wondering what curse that's referring to. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Verse 4, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Even so, Lord, come quickly. Let your kingdom come. Praise God. When God's kingdom is here, it will be perfect peace. If you read the Old Testament, they talked a lot about the day of the Lord. And one of the aspects of the day of the Lord is when God came back and reigned on this earth. And there would be no more war. And then, as we read in Revelation, no more sorrow, no more death. Everyone would be, there would be justice and peace. So looking forward to that day when God's kingdom comes. And so you can pray that. In fact, has anyone ever heard of the name Maranatha or the word Maranatha? Uh, you'll see churches that have Maranatha in them. Uh, I, used to, I used to listen to the Moody Bible Institute, and they would have the Maranatha singers on there quite a bit. In fact, there is a Maranatha music record label. And that word, Maranatha, it's actually a, I believe it's an Aramaic word, and it literally means, Oh, Lord, come. So when they're saying Maranatha, they're looking forward to the coming of that kingdom. They're looking forward to the coming of that day. So even in our prayers, we should not forget our purpose to build the kingdom of God. Your kingdom come. That's why I'm here, God. That's why I'm praying. I'm trying to be a part of the building of your kingdom. I'm trying to be a part of what you're trying to put together. You're either inside building or you're outside, period. Oh, goodness. Where and what can we do to build the kingdom of God? Let your kingdom come. There is a danger, though, when we think about that, because whose kingdom needs to come? What does it say? Let your, well, that you're there. Who, who's it talking about? Yeah, it's talking about God. Let your kingdom come. There's a danger. In uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, start with verse 2. David said to Joab and the leaders of the people, go and number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, then let me know how many people there are. Joab said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are, but my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord want this thing done? And then notice that last part. Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? That goes back to Exodus chapter 30, where God told them, don't number the people. The only time you're to number the people is when it comes time for sacrifice. He said, God said, if you number the people, it literally says they have to pay a ransom. But David forgot whose kingdom it was. Get David lost sight that he was, he, he may be the king, but he was still the servant of God. He wanted to know how mighty he was. He wanted to know how many men he ruled over. He says, go count them. He wanted to know his might. And God reminded him of who Israel belonged to. They counted them. They were exciting numbers. And then God punished them. And he reminded, it's actually interesting, I don't have it in my notes, but God gave him a choice. 
And David acknowledged, hey, the fault is mine. I did this. But we lose sight of the fact that we're working for God's kingdom. And we work so hard, sometimes working for God's kingdom, that we forget and it becomes my kingdom. It's, you know, it's not my ministry. It's his ministry. This is not my church. This is his church. You're not my people. You're his people. And if I'm building for me, if you're building for you, you're building for the wrong reason. You can do perfectly good and noble things and still be building for the wrong reason. See, what happens when we build for us, when we forget whose kingdom it is, and we build for us, we can do good and noble things, but it tends to not turn out the way we planned. It eventually comes out in the end. And in today's day and age, we see, we see ministries crumbling and falling because somewhere they, lo they lost sight of whose kingdom they were building for. We see sex scandals and money scandals. And here's the thing. I don't think any of those individuals started out thinking, you know, I'm going to start a national min an international ministry and build it up for God, and then I'm going to ruin it all. That was not the plan. But they lost sight in the middle of it about who it was for and what they were doing. And it became somewhere along the way, not about God's kingdom, but about their kingdom. They stopped building for him and they started building for themselves. So when you're praying, be on guard. God, what I'm praying for, let your kingdom come. You accomplish this. Let your glory be built, not mine. In fact, I find myself, that's what you can do to guard yourself. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Brad, am I, am I up here so that you'll look at me and think, man, that's a good man? Or am, I, or am I up here trying to feed God's people? Because God's people need to be fed. Because God said to do it. You know, are we cleaning the church? Well, I shouldn't go there. <laughs> well, let's pick on the music ministry because I'm part of that. Are we trying to sing our best because we want people to think how great we are? Or are we trying to, to sing our best to honor God? It may seem like a fine line, but it matters. I'd rather have somebody off key singing to honor God than somebody on key honoring themselves. Is it for my glory or God's glory? Is it for his kingdom or am I trying to build something for myself? See, when we do, when we focus on ourselves, we can get defensive. You, you, you want to be a part of this, but this is my ministry. You, you want to you step in here and do this, but that belongs to me. No, no, it doesn't. It belongs to God. It can, make, it can make pastors go, he's trying to steal my people. And most of the time, he's not trying to steal anybody. He's just preaching the word, and they chose to go there. But, you know, it's, it's, it's affecting my church. No, it's God's church. And if God wants them at your church, they'll come back. She's taking my credit. Let her. You know, the funny thing about credit is if you hang around somebody who's taking credit long enough, you realize that they don't deserve the credit they're taking. Because you, you start asking them questions about what they've done and they can't give you the answers. <laughs> and you, you realize, oh, wait, this person doesn't really know what they're talking about. Let them take your credit. Who are you doing it for? I don't want them listening to that person. When you understand that it's his kingdom and it's God's people, 
you understand that maybe God's going to use that person to say something that you can't say. I have learned that. There are things that I cannot say to you because I've not, I've not experienced it. Or, or literally, I don't know how to do it. It's not in my background or my makeup. But you bring somebody else along, they can say things because they're put together a little differently. You got a brother Bledsoe, you got uh, a brother Mackey, you got a pastor, you got several men that can bring the word of God, and they all do it differently, and that's important. Because you want different. If you look at the uh, nutrition pyramid, there's several items on there. And you go to any nutritionist, and they're not going to tell you to eat one thing for the rest of your life. You know, two men can take the same verse and, and go completely different directions with it. One is not right and one is not wrong. They're both right. God's just using them in a different way. So just remember, it's his kingdom. That's, the, that's kind of the danger of your kingdom come. But there's an awesomeness to your kingdom come. Let's say they actually are attacking. Most of the time, they're not. Most of the time, they're trying to serve God. But let's say they are attacking. You know the awesome thing about it being God's kingdom? They're not attacking you. They think they're attacking you, but they're attacking God. And that never turns out well. Let me give you an example. 2 Kings chapter 19. Start with verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Let me give you a little bit of a background here. There's a king named Sennacherib. He's an Assyrian, one of the cruelest empires that has ever existed on God's green earth. And they have come and they have surrounded Jerusalem with an army in the hundreds of thousands. And they write a letter to Hezekiah. And in that letter, they go, hey, look. Here is a list of all the gods that we've beaten. And they list a bunch of cities and their gods. And they go, see all these gods we've beaten? What makes you think your God can face us? And they sent that letter to Hezekiah. Hezekiah see, t- gets the letter. He goes to the house of the Lord, and he spreads it before the Lord. And in verse 15, then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent approach, reproach rather, to, to my kingdom. Sent reproach to, to, to my people. You know, this, this is going to mess up my plans, God. Come on. No, he said, he's reproached the living God. So Hezekiah remembered whose kingdom it was. And when, I mean, you got to understand, when I'm talking about an army hundreds of thousands strong, Jerusalem was the last free city in the kingdom of Judah, and they are surrounded. This is the last stand. He's holding out. I'm <laughs> winging a prayer. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. This is an army that has tromped and marched over every nation in its path. But then he says, God, it's not about me. It's about you. Look what they said. In 2 Kings, go to, skip down to verse 35. It came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, being a smart man, king of Assyria, departed, went away, and returned home, and remained in Nineveh. He went, oh, we challenged God. God responded, it's time to go home. (laughs) And then I was reading this verse. It came to pass as he was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, that his sons Adra, Lemek, and Sherazar struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Ezra Haddon, his son, reigned in his place. So he went home to his God, and his God could not protect him in the slightest. 
in the house of Hezekiah takes a letter spreads it out and God says all right back up Hezekiah watch me work Sennacherib goes to his temple to worship and his God can't even protect him from his murderous sons so when they attack you if they are attacking you they're not attacking you they're attacking God let them he'll take care of it don't worry about it don't stress he'll defend you he can take care of himself all right let's look at the the second half of uh, verse 10 your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so like it is in heaven so how is his will done in heaven well Psalms 103 20 says bless the Lord you his angels who excel in strength who do his word heeding or obeying the voice of his word so in heaven the angels guess what they obey him they do what he says to do <laughs> how about creation Luke chapter 22 and verse 24 they came to him and awoke him saying master master we are perishing then he arose rebuked the wind and the raging of the water and they ceased and there was calm but he said to them where's your faith and they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. So when God speaks, the angels obey, and creation obeys. You know, the only people that struggle with obeying God, you want to know who that is? Look in the mirror. It's you. <laughs> Humanity. Humanity is the one that struggles with obeying the will of God that's why that prayer is in there your will be done in earth as it is in heaven God this something's got to happen to make sure that what you, what is done is what you want done that what is accomplished is what you want I want accomplished uh, brother brother Rainey isn't here and I'm, I think he was the one that gave me this thought so you'll have to remind him that I said this you know in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 it says man was formed out of the dust of the ground so you're formed out of dirt. And if you go to 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Those earthen vessels is talking about, guess what? It's you. So thy will be done in me as it is in heaven, in this dirt, God. Let your will be done in this dirt as it is in heaven. Let your will be done by this man as it is in heaven. Well, you know, we're real good. We're real good about praying, Lord, let Joe, Lord, it would be so much better if Joe just did what you wanted him to do. God, if Esther would just get her act together and follow what you want done, everything would just be so much better. But it's not about them. There's only one bit of earth that you can control, and it's the one that's standing in your shoes. And looking at yourself in the mirror that's the only earth, part of earth that you can control so when you pray your will be done in earth Russell you're praying let me do your will God show it to me and let me do it if it was easy you wouldn't have to pray it I love when somebody, I was, was talking about submission one time, and somebody, 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 somebody said, if you want to do it, it's not submission. <laughs> I think it was Sister Crystal told me that. It's true. If you want to do it, it's not submission. Submission is when you do it when you don't want to do it. And I love to give examples. Luke chapter 22 verse 41. He was withdrawn from them about a stolen throw. And he knelt down and prayed. This is Jesus saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus facing the crucifixion. And his humanity cried out, is there any other way? And it wasn't even just, it wasn't about the physical pain. It was about the fact that this innocent humanity, this innocent God was about to take on the weight of every sin that ever been committed or ever would be committed. Uh, strain and anguish that we can't even begin to comprehend or even grasp. 
And he's saying, do we have to do it this way? And he says, not my will. If, 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 if I had a choice, if, if the humanity of Jesus had a choice, we'd find another way. But not what I want to do. Let your will be done. If Jesus needed to pray a prayer of submission, then so do we. Can I say that again? If Jesus needed to pray a prayer of not my will but yours, then what makes you think that you can get away with not praying that? Please note that this is active. What do you mean, Brother Tim? We have to actively decide to do God's will. God's will requires action. It requires you to do something. God's will never requires to sit on your hind end and do nothing. And if that's what you're doing, begin to seek God's will. Because God has a way of, of getting people to move. If he wants them to move, he'll get them to move. And it's not usually comfortable. So begin to seek that. There's a song called I Surrender All. You probably have heard it. You know, I surrender all. All to thee, my precious, blessed Savior. I surrender all. I told them today that I was going to introduce my new, uh, my new song. Bring up that next one. Because this is what we usually sing. I surrender partially at best. I surrender incrementally, if at all, only things I care to lose, do I surrender to you. <laughs> I hold on to things. Want to follow the will of God? Hold things loosely. What have, not, what I, what have I not given to you, God? What have I not submitted to you? Let your will be done. All right. I'm going to read some verses that you'll love. You'll love. I know you'll love them. Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. It's a great verse, isn't it? How about Matthew 18, beginning with 19? Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. How about Psalms 37.4? Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Or uh, Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You ever feel like these prayers are not being answered? You ever feel like those things don't happen quite the way you thought they would? Let me show you the reason. Or, excuse me. There are men that are smarter than me, and they may have a different opinion than I do. Let me show you what I think is the reason. James chapter 4. Uh, let's do verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. Then you may spend it on your pleasures. One of the reasons, why, why are you saying this here and now, Brother Tim? Well, I'm saying this here and now because one of the reasons that we don't see these great promises happen is because we don't pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Some of the reasons that we don't see God move the way we want to move is because it had nothing to do with God's glory. We may, some of us are real good at using that language. But remember, he knows the thoughts and intents. It sounds familiar. I think I said that earlier. He knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. It's not about the language. It's about the thought and the intent. He knows. James says it's possible to ask amiss. Well, what's, what's one way to ask amiss? It's to forget whose kingdom it is. Forget whose will needs to be done. It's what we want. It's for our glory. When the desires of our heart match the desires of God, 
when the desires of our heart match the desires of God, we will receive. I'll just give you a personal example of this. I know I've mentioned it before, but I'm sorry. It was a, it was a pivotal moment in my life. <laughs> Called us in. They said, there's some, but there's people out there that are acting bad. I'm paraphrasing. This is at Bible college. So after they yell at us for a little while, look, I have a prayer meeting. So I started praying. I knew who they were talking about. And I wasn't happy about it either. I remember, God, don't you see what he's doing? Don't you see him making a mockery of you? And the man of God you put in charge, don't you? Get him. Why don't you judge him? Because I was jealous and I was angry. And this was not a voice, but I, I remember just getting that. God spoke to me. And he said, no. Because when I judge, it's done. And when that thought hit me, it turned my prayer around from God, get him to God. Have mercy on him. He doesn't know what he's he doesn't know what he's playing with. He doesn't understand what's going on. It totally it went from God punished to God just protect him. Don't just get a hold of him somehow. Why? Because I got my eyes off of me and got my eyes on what God wanted done and what God wanted to accomplish. I haven't seen him in twenty years. I think he's a pastor somewhere. Let them look that up. God didn't get him. And I bet you there's a bunch of people who are grateful. So let's begin to, when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. To remember what that means. Can you stand with me tonight? God, help me never to lose sight of your kingdom or your will. And help me always to put myself in the right place. To always, Lord Jesus, consider that. To remember who you are and what you want to accomplish. Mercy and love, God. That it's for your glory, not mine. People will never remember who I am, God. But I want to build something for you that will last long beyond me. Help us to get a hold of that attitude that it is your kingdom and your will that are what, important, that what are important. And then, Lord Jesus, as we grasp that, begin to demonstrate your power. As we get a hold of the fact that it's for your kingdom and your glory, begin to show what you can do when we get our focus right. Be with these people this week, God. Lead them into places, Jesus. Let, make your will plain to them. Make your will obvious to them. Make your kingdom most important to them, Jesus. Help them to see it, to understand it, and to serve it. I want to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. All right, well, you're dismissed in Jesus' name. <laughs>